Cloud. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Renaissance Society and our program tonight called Back of the White House, presented by Mary Ellen Burns and and assimilated with assimilated help from Kimberly Graham. Uh, we have got a lot of great information for you tonight. We have just a few things we'll share with you and then we'll ask you to mute yourselves and stop your videos so Mary Ellen can uh, present her the information. We are recording the program tonight, so a link will be available after the fact if you want to re review this program again. Um, Mary Ellen Burns is a food historian and author of books on food and regional history, including Lost Restaurants of Sacramento, I love that book, and A Taste of History. She facilitates food, travel, and cultural programs for the Renaissance Society, as well as historical and food societies around the world. She and Kimberly Graham work together on story programs to capture the voices of people whose stories are often neglected. Kimberly Graham unfortunately can't be with us tonight. She was going to bring some of the voices you'll hear this evening to life. She's a writer from the Bay Area and she has presented a number of programs on African-American cooking and the culture of food for the Renaissance Society and the Sacramento Public Library. So if again, if you would be so kind to please mute your microphones and stop your video that also helps with bandwidth and make sure that everybody can hear and see everything that's being presented all along. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to use the chat and post your questions in there. Uh, Mary Ellen will be available throughout if there's something that needs clarification on anything she just spoke about, but for the most part, we'll answer most of the questions at the end of her presentation. We'll, she'll be sending out a link uh, of the recording of this program within the next 48 to 72 hours, plus many of the recipes that she's going to share with you this evening. So this is a win-win on a whole bunch of levels. Thanks so much. And Mary Ellen, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So for hundreds of years, slave owning white families depended upon African Americans to grow, prepare and serve their food. Black hands, enslaved and free, have also run the White House kitchen as chefs, personal cooks, butlers, stewards, and servers for every White House kitchen, um, or for every first family for more than 200 years, beginning with George Washington's presidential term in the late 1700s. I called this back of the White House, but of course we didn't have a White House during all of those years, so it really is the president's house as well. I wanna say that we owe a debt of gratitude to those rarely remembered workers who produced or served meals for presidential families and for domestic and foreign visitors at formal and state dinners. Most remained nameless until a new generation of culinary historians and African-American scholars and writers started to uncover their stories. We're going to highlight just a few of them tonight, uh, the stories and names that have been really well documented. Uh, we're also going to pay tribute to a lot of those stories that were harder to document. A lot of this material I received from a book that was uh, from Adrian Miller. I'm going to introduce that book now as a, are you able to see my share screen? And Adrian uh, wrote a, um, a book that he'll describe here. <laughs> The White House chefs are a group of workers who are there to prepare the food for the president and the first family. We could just look at the food served and say, oh, that looks good, tastes good, and now that's it. But this is usually a more complex story. 150 African-Americans have been involved as White House chefs. African-American presidential chefs have been there from day one. And the number of chefs, how they were celebrated culinary artists in their time and the roles that they played on the presidency uh, you know really transcended the servant employer kind of relationship I mean in, in many cases they became family confidants one example is uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt 
when he would go to Warm Springs, Georgia, uh, for long stays to get uh, rehabilitation for his polio condition, there was an African American cook that was lent to him from a local family. Her name is Daisy Bonner. Um, and another one of the White House staffers, Lizzie McDuffie, would travel down to Warm Springs. So often family members or the White House physician would give some prescribed thing for the president to eat. Daisy Bonner and Lizzie McDuffie would look at the president and if he looked a little peaked, they would serve whatever was prescribed. And as they were leaning over him to serve it, they would whisper in his ear, don't eat that. And then he would just play around with his food, act like he's not hungry. And then when everybody cleared they'd hook him up in the kitchen with what he really wanted. Sometimes they were civil rights advocates, but they were very good at what they did. A lot of, and a lot of the people working in the White House kitchen prided themselves on being on call for the first family. Because again, it was extremely important to them uh, to have that relationship. But in the broader community, they were often looked to as um, statures or pillars of the community. And one of the interesting things in the case of White House cooks who were African-American, often when civil rights leaders couldn't get the ear of the president, they would go to the cook and ask them to whisper in the ear of the president about some policy issue because they knew that that cook probably had a very strong and personal relationship with the president. It could mention things um, back and forth. Uh, so you see that happen quite a bit in presidential history. An example that I love is with Zephyr Wright, who was the longtime cook for the Johnson family, Lyndon Johnson and Lady Bird Johnson. So she started cooking for them in the 40s. And a lot of people attribute uh, Johnson's rise in the Congress due to her cooking. And very few people passed up the opportunity to go uh, have one of Lyndon Johnson's meals made by Zephyr Wright. But um, when Johnson was supporting the 1964 Civil Rights Act, once he becomes president, he used Zephyr Wright's Jim Crow experiences to persuade members of Congress to support that bill. And after he signed the bill, you know, he used several pins to sign it. He presented Zephyr Wright with one of those pins and said, you deserve this as much as anyone. So there's a president getting a window on black life and using that to do something monumental in the policy uh, arena. When I started finding out about the various chefs and these hidden stories, I thought these people should have been discovered a long time ago and someone else should have told their story. That in so many circumstances, when difficulties and obstacles were thrown their way, these people found a way to be professional at what they did and there were times when they pressed for better uh, quality of life for their people, or even for their own circumstance in the White House, how they overcame uh, racism, um, classism, also just being kind of in this low wage, difficult environment, but doing the very best to make sure that our presidents were happy. Thank you. And now I'm going to share my screen again and start my slideshow. And thank you for bearing with me. So again, uh, this talk is back of the White House and uh, we are hoping that you'll be able to see Kimberly again on another program soon. I'm just going to show you a few slides. This was um, Washington DC was a slaving city uh, and the incidents and badges of slavery were omnipresent. Enslaved people were sold at spots throughout the city. Slave coffles and slave coffles were where they would shackle the slaves, moved regularly about the streets. Slave pens dotted the cityscape. And enslaved people busily constructed many of the city's buildings and much of its infrastructure and did a wide range of activities associated with forced servitude. I hope that uh, all of you remember the great quote by Michelle Obama, I wake up every morning in a house that was built by slaves. This is a drawing of the White House uh, when the building began. It's hard to really imagine any social event in 19th century Washington, D.C. that didn't have an African-American somewhere involved in every aspect from start to finish. This included buying supplies at the market and preparing and serving the food and drinks. As one historian noted of the time period, never, nearly every distinguished family in Washington had colored servants, butlers, and cooks. The legacy of slavery permeated uh, the building, its grounds, and the entire city, Washington, D.C., was carved out of swampland from two slaving states, Maryland and Virginia, 
The land was donated by planters who were enriched by the tobacco trade and slave labor. Slave labor was used to construct the building and slaveholding presidents and enslaved people worked and lived there. I wanna show you, this is a list that I think you're gonna be surprised to see. The following is a list of the African-Americans by presidential administration of possession, position who had a hand in presidential food preparation. Some uh, are, are not listed because uh, the ones who participated were not identified. We're going to talk about some of those today, Samuel uh, Francis and Hercules. Uh, we are going to not talk about uh, Dinah Thomas Jefferson. We will talk about um, uh, well, this is interesting because it lists Peter Hemings. We're going to really talk about James Hemings, even though he didn't work at the White House directly. But you can see that every president was using slave cooks. And sometimes you will see that there were, uh, after the Civil uh, War, there were railroad, railroad cooks. You'll note them quite often. And that was because so much of politicizing was done by railroad that the presidents would take their stewards and workers with them. So uh, they did receive wages. They were no longer slaved, but to this date, there is not, except for a few Jamaicans, there is no one who has worked at the Capitol that was not a slave themselves or a descendant of a slave. You will notice how many uh, Dwight Eisenhower had, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Baines Johnson. We're gonna talk a lot about Mrs. Wright. And you'll see that the kitchens at those time were almost all black. Richard Nixon as well, Gerald Ford, Ronald Reagan, George Bush, William uh, Clinton Bush. And you'll also notice Barack Obama as well. So early in our nation's history, presidents not only paid for all their domestic staff, but also underwrote all the entertaining costs. President Washington started this unwritten rule and it endured for more than a century after President James Buchanan uh, left office. This custom partly explains why so many slaveholding presidents actually brought their enslaved uh, cooks and personal servants with them. It was a lot cheaper than paying. Uh, they were paid competitive wages for professional cook uh, um, uh, in the open um, market. Uh, when there were some free slaves, so some free slaves worked it well. Uh, historically, presidential cooks seldom shop for food themselves. From the late 70s until the 1940s, the stewards, housekeepers, maitre d' and food coordinators discreetly bought the groceries. One of the presidential hotspots, and I know this is not a very clear photo, um, that they had was a center market. And that opened on 15th of December of 1801. It's located where the National Archives building stands now. A few executives, notably Presidents Thomas Jefferson and William Henry Harrison, actually visited the center market themselves, which was demolished in 31. Only in the case of an emergency, such as a lack of dairy products, did a butler or a member of the Secret Service or some other staffer purchase food. Today, because of food uh, security um, concerns, food procurement is outsourced to contractors who are actually vetted by the Secret Service and sworn to secrecy, or the culinary staff shop anonymously at local grocery stores. And here is another shot. This picture is actually taken of the market in 1901. A team of five staffed the earliest presidential kitchens. A steward or a housekeeper was responsible for purchasing the groceries and planning menus. There was a head cook, a second cook for the resident staff, and two additional staff for preparation and cleanup duties. That greatly expanded years later. Uh, over time, it really extended to eight or nine if the president requested a private chef cooking only for the first family. The head cook reported to the first lady, uh, I'm assuming that they will now uh, go to the first gentleman. It would be very interesting to see how Doug Emhoff handles that, to set the menus for both their husbands, and in many instances became the diet enforcer in chief. 
They planned all the private menus, consulted with the kitchen staff on what to make, sometimes on how to make it and what the president should be eating. And again, this is the center market. Living in the White House was considered a perk, but not always a pleasant one. Enslaved cooks were forced to live the majority of their lives in the White House's basement or attic where the servants' quarters were located, but they weren't alone. By the 1890s, the basement was overrun with vermin, insects and rats so plentiful that they dragged an entire ham off the servants' dining room table during the Lyndon Johnson administration in the 1960s. Months later, an atrocious order led residents to a completely gnawed ham bone behind a wall. Situated in a swamp, the basement typically flooded after rainstorms and it was claimed that one African-American cook killed the rat invasion by sitting on them. This is a typical kitchen from 1901. The slave quarters accessed a great uh, kitchen 40 feet long with large fireplaces at each end where meals were initially cooked a family kitchen storage and workroom, and the slave bedrooms and kitchens where enslaved um, uh, African-Americans ate, slept, socialized, and made the best of their imprisonment. And I do want to make it clear that this is an imprisonment. They lived in, um, the live-in requirement continued well into the 1920s in a Jim Crow city where Blacks could not travel freely. With the FDR administration in the early 1930s, they were finally able to move off the White House grounds or apartments in the White House. However, until desegregation really fully operated in the 1950s, there wasn't a place for them to eat near the uh, White House. If they did try, they would be refused service. This is Lillian Rogers who wrote a wonderful book on, um, I think it's my 30 years backstairs at the White House. What she declared was many people think that working at the White House is easy because the work is divided among so many people and those who work there have soft prestige jobs. Let me tell you that more people have ruined their health under the grueling strain of working at the White House than you would believe. We're now gonna go back in history and we're going to talk a little bit about a, a controversy. This is George Washington, of course, and Samuel Francis. Some of us who visit New York might have visited his tavern in New York called Francis Tavern. There is some dispute of whether he was indeed a uh, black, um, uh, but there, and historians fight back and forth. He was probably a quadroon, which was the title then where there was only a fourth. President George uh, Washington really set a high standard for all the stewards who followed him. Uh, he was born in the West Indies. He arrived in New York City in 1755. Like Hamilton, he had a real entrepreneurial uh, spirit and opened his first business selling pickles and preserves. Seven years later in 1762 is when he opened his tavern at the corner of Pearl and Broad Street that became an important social uh, gathering place, gastronomical attraction, and the center of revolutionary discussion and activities. The Tavern and Francis both became intricately tied to important events connected to the American Revolution. If you have an opportunity to read more about him, we can't go into it here. He's really well worth reading about. So George Washington first visited the Tavern on April 13th, 1776. Throughout the war, Frank, uh, Francis frequently provided food material and even cover intelligence to members of the Continental Army. The tavern held such a special part, a uh, place in George Washington's heart that he gave his farewell to the Continental Army troops in the tavern's upper room on the 4th of December in 1783. He had hoped that George Washington hoped it would be a true farewell and that he could quietly retire to his plantation at Mount Vernon, Virginia. Yet public clamoring for his return was so great that he was forced out of retirement and reluctantly agreed to become the first president of the United States. President, Truman, uh, president Washington was keenly aware that everything he did was heavily scrutinized 
and would set precedent for future presidents. How he dined and entertained was no exception. He wanted the best for his table. In May 1789, he hired Francis to serve as a steward for the first executive mansion. Uh, once in charge, he let everyone know that he was truly in charge. He thought that he would be able to capitalize on his business relationships with the president and therefore publish a bill of notice in local newspapers that left no doubt that all of the household matters went to him. He served a very short stint in New York City before the capital was moved to Philadelphia in 1790. The team that he put together included both blacks, um, enslaved blacks, some free blacks and free whites. Who, and who he had actually relocated from Mount Vernon. With the team in place, he began the difficult task of running the presidential household. We're lucky to have a lot of letters that were written about his time there. Senator William McCauley described a table bursting with the rich assortment of dishes, roasted fish, boiled meat, bacon and poultry for the main course, followed by ice cream, jellies, pies, puddings and melons for dessert. Washington was known for downing a pint of beer or two or three. Uh, you can see from how he's dressed, a lot of food historians said that at dinner parties, he would cut quite a figure in his silk knee breeches, white ruffled shirt and carefully powdered black hair. You'll notice here he's uh, wearing white and he would stand at the sideboard throughout the meal to watch that the footman attended all the guests properly. With Francis's help, the Washingtons earned a really solid reputation for their presidential entertaining and guests looked forward to being at their table. He managed to stay in his good graces for until um, 1794 when he left of his own volition to open up a tavern in Philadelphia that he ran with his wife, Elizabeth. He ended up dying the next year and is buried in an unmarked grave in the cemetery at St. Peter's Episcopal Church this is, and I was reluctant to show this, but you will see, this is school children in 1910 portraying Jane Tours and Samuel Francis as an African-American and the young man is in blackface. There are hundreds of photos like this on the internet because it was a very popular thing to do. And I brought it because we aren't the first to start thinking about um, African-American History Month. They were thinking about it then as, as well. Whoops, my apologies. And um, Jane Torres was a patriot and had a role uh, with Samuel Francis in confirming information about the British conspiracy with Benedict Arnold. This is actually Mount Vernon's kitchen. So the Washingtons uh, really relied on enslaved butlers, cooks, waiters, and housemaids to support their daily meals and frequent dinner parties. Dinner parties were so frequent at um, Mount Vernon that sometimes there would be as many as 600 guests. The family typically ate two substantial meals per day, breakfast at 7 a.m. and dinner at three, tea or coffee sometimes followed in the early evening. At Mount Vernon, the slave butler Frank Lee supervised preparations for the Washington's meals ensuring that the enslaved waiters and the housemaids set the table properly with an elaborate array of porcelain dishes, glasses, silverware, and decorative ornaments. When the cooks finished preparing the food, waiters carefully transported heavy flatter platters from the de uh, detached kitchen to the dining room. During the meal, waiters in white and red livery stood silently against the walls, ready to refill glasses. Cooking in uh, the kitchen was hot, Smoky, you can kind of see it here, demanding and skilled work. Enslaved cooks like Dahl, Hercules, who you'll hear more about later, Nathan and Lucy, arose at four each morning to light the fire in the oven and prepare for the meals to be served. Their duties could continue well into the, the evening. The Washingtons played great trust in their cooks whose talent was evident in descriptions of the, um, the meals under uh, Martha Washington's supervision, cooks planned menus and selected ingredients for each day's meals. Enslaved laborers on the estate grew and harvested most of Washington's food, wheat and corn from the fields, fresh vegetables from the garden, fruit from the orchards, et cetera, et cetera. Their role in the kitchen allowed enslaved cooks to really shape the tastes of the household and the region. And this is not a picture actually of, um, Hercules, whom I'm going to talk about now, 
Uh, Hercules photos oftentimes um, uh, confused with someone else. I want to stop the share here for a second and go to another YouTube video. Because I think it's important for you to see how the slaves themselves. Everybody got to eat. Got to eat. It don't matter whether you master or slave. Of course, we aren't eating the things that the Washingtons and their people are up at the mansion. They eating smoked ham, salmon gundy, savory patties, oysters, even ice cream. You know, fancy food. But we slaves are eating simpler meals. And see, we slaves, uh, we working all day long in the farm and in the house. And who do you think is cooking those fan meals for the masses? So you see, we don't have time to cook all those dishes for ourselves. I'm cooking soft cake. It's a one pot meal. See, we getting our fish and cornmeal as part of our ration of food. I'll start with that. It all goes into this pot with some water. Then you can throw in pretty much anything you got. I put in some nice greens and some okra and squash from a little garden that I keep. A few hickory nuts my boys found in the forest. Sometimes I like to add a little spice to make it more tasty. And then you just put the pot over the fire and it cooks all day. It's a good meal. It might not be fancy, but we ain't got time for fancy. Everybody got Oops. to eat. My apologies. Let me close that one up and go back to our slideshow. Back to Hercules. When George Washington took office, he really understood that good food and drink was a, diplomat, a diplomatic necessity. We were uh, uh, still trying to recover from the Revolutionary War, getting money in our coffers, feeding people and, and having them drink well was really important. Um, so we talked before about Samuel Francis. He ended up placing an advertisement in the New York Packet newspaper to fill the first presidential cook position. And the ad read, a cook is wanted for the president of the United States. No one need apply who is not perfect in the business and can bring indubitable testimonials of sobriety, honesty, and attention to the duties of the station. That cook was an addition to the nine slaves that Washington would bring to Philadelphia in 1790 to work in the house. Hercules was one of the nine. His cooking was very much loved in the Washington household. His Washington stepson, George Washington Park Custis described Hercules as a celebrated artiste, as highly accomplished and proficient in the culinary art as could be found in the United States. This is a kind of typical dinner that could be found at Mount Vernon. Leg of boiled pork goose, you can see this minced pea peas. Whenever George Washington was at the Capitol or in his home, he wanted Hercules cooking. He was really commander of the kitchen. He had eight assistants who would cook and was responsible for procuring all the foodstuffs for the family. There were stories uh, that he would promenade through the streets of Philadelphia with loyal fans following him to the market. The market was the largest open air market in the day, uh, in the world during its day. The boat actually came in for Cuba three days a week and there were bananas and pineapples and other exotic fruits, vegetables and meats. If you had the money, you could get practically anything you wanted. Uh, because of this, as culinary produce, he was able to bring his son Richmond to Philadelphia. He was also given a lot of privileges that most slaves were not. He actually accrued a salary of one to two hundred dollars a year by selling leftovers known as slops from the presidential kitchen. He was a celebrated dandy and the chef kept an equally meticulous kitchen. Uh, Different accounts really uh, talk about his reasons to escape to freedom. He was one of the few slaves that was able to successfully escape Washington. Some um, believe that he was so enamored of Philadelphia that when Washington left to return to Mount Vernon, he just chose to run away. That's not uh, true because there, which I'll explain later, the laws in Philadelphia, he could have stayed in Philadelphia. Others really say that he escaped because soon after being made a regular laborer at Mount Vernon, 
uh, instead of his usual check duties, he decided to run. The Washingtons, um, who obviously were the only president that actually gave up their slaves, often returned their slaves to Mount Vernon from Philadelphia to circumvent a Pennsylvania law that allowed slaves to claim freedom after residing in the state for a minimum of six months. Weekly reports from Mount Vernon indicated that Hercules and other male house servants were put to work with the bricklayers and the gardeners uh, in early 1797. He was most likely not needed at the kitchen anymore because there would be no visitors at Mount Vernon while George and Martha were in Philadelphia. Washington was really angered and confused by the decision for him to run away, believing that Hercules really led a privileged life and should have been happy there. He even gave him three bottles of rum uh, from he and Martha to bury his wife in September of 1787. Uh, in March of 1797, he went to somebody, a detective by the name of Tobias Lear, that he wanted Tobias or Hercules to be found and returned to Mount Vernon as soon as possible. He was so angered, and he wrote many letters to people about this, that when Hercules could not be found, he purchased a new slave to replace him. And... Um, breaking his own code of saying that he would never purchase any more slaves during his lifetime. Although many diligent inquiries were made for him, he was never apprehended. It's too long of a story to uh, talk about where it was surmised that he went, but the assumption is, is that he actually did possibly flee the country on one of the many boats out of Philadelphia. This drawing or uh, art, is often attributed to Hercules, but it is not. So if you were to find it on the internet, um, don't get confused. And I'm, I'm talking this part of the section, Thomas Jefferson or James Hemings, the father of American cuisine. In the 18th century, James Hemings, a slave, was one of America's most accomplished chefs. In many ways, there is a dispute of whether he was the first celebrity chef or Hercules. Many more people actually knew James Hemming. To many culinary uh, historians today, he's really recognized as the father, principal father of American cuisine. Thomas Jefferson was the principal author of the Declaration of Independence. He was the third president of the United States, a farmer, a scientist and philosopher. He has also been referred to as the father of American cuisine. He was also James Hemings' owner. James Hemings arrived at Monticello, Jefferson's rural Virginia state as just a nine-year-old boy, along with other siblings, including Sally, who we're not going to talk about today, and mother Elizabeth Hemings. They were part of the Wales estate and among the many enslaved people who came into Thomas Jefferson's possession through his wife's inheritance. Six of Elizabeth Hemings' 10 children were fathered by John Wells, making James a younger half-brother to Jefferson's wife, Martha Washington. This family would prove to be extremely capable, intelligent, and resourceful. James was bright. He could read and write. He would often accompany Jefferson to meetings with wealthy landowners, farmers, and political adversaries. Jefferson trusted him. And so when he sailed to France in 1784 to become America's trade minister, he brought the 19-year-old James Hemings with him, especially for the purpose of starting, studying the art of cookery. Paris was the culinary capital of the world at this time. Chefs were really pushing the boundaries of food and drink. New cultivars in the garden, techniques in the kitchen, extravagant table settings, crystal and silver, and eating for entertainment, not nourishment reigned. Long fascinated by gastronomy and viticulture, Jefferson also saw the future of agriculture and America transformed if he could transform or could apply a lot of their techniques and culture to America upon his return. Hemings ended up spending five years in the city mastering the art of French cuisine. He hired tutors so he could learn French. His training was really extensive. He apprenticed with some of the finest caterers and restaurateurs in the country, including Monsieur Combeau. Uh, uh, my French is horrible, my apologies. Pastry chefs, and even a chef of the Prince 
de Kant, who was known for the splendor of his table. After three years of study, he also became the head chef at the Hotel de Langeac, Jefferson's residence that also functioned as the American embassy and as a hotel. Here, his dishes were served to international guests, statements, authors, scientists, and European aristocrats. His wages of 24 um, livres a month at the time was worth about $4, was a regular income and more than the occasional gratuity that he would always get, but half of what Jefferson paid his previous chef cuisinier. And this is Hemings in that kitchen. He, in 1780, not in that kitchen, but when he uh, returned, um, in 1787, Hemings took over as chef de cuisine at Jefferson Stately Paris home. It was a big job. It meant he supervised other white servants in the kitchen, something that was hard to imagine, if, uh, especially under the strict racial strictures in uh, Virginia. Paris offered an altogether different life than the one that Hemings had left behind. From, for a slave to reach those heights is pretty incredible, says food historian Paula Morgot, who has recreated French classic dishes of the era at Monte, uh, Monticello using the same techniques or cooking tools that Hercules would have used. Techniques that he used for dishes like snow eggs, one of the few Hemings recipes that the Jefferson family preserved the, through the generations. And they are little puffs of meringue that are poached in milk syrup, served chilled over English custard. Those are techniques that are really considered uh, quite sophisticated even today. His training certainly surpassed that of any other American chef of the era. Ease of the, uh, with the language would really bode well for his work in the, experience, in the kitchen and his the experience of the French culture around him. It was a time you have to remember of real political unrest in France that contained talk of rights and liberty. His familiarity of the language likely also made him aware of a law that allowed a slave, even one brought in from another country, to petition the courts for freedom, or actually somebody else had to petition for them. His wages made retaining a lawyer a possibility, but nevertheless, Hemings did not pursue that option and left Paris with Jefferson in October of 1789 to the return to the United States, an enslaved man. His negotiations for freedom would come later. He ended up returning to America with Jefferson in 1789. He thought he'd have another chance to pursue his freedom by going back to Paris. The trip home was really gonna be temporary, but once back in the United States, Jefferson became George Washington's sec uh, Secretary of State. So he spent several more years in Jefferson service in various cities, including New York and Philadelphia. Uh, his first organized American kitchen was in a small house in New York following their arrival there. The stay was brief. The seat of government moved to Philadelphia in December of 1790. There he would be called upon to prepare dinners for European diplomats, the president, Jefferson's fellow cabinet members, congressmen, and many national and international visitors. Jefferson came home and he began to draw up plans for his massive gardens at Monticello, over a thousand square feet that would have a sample of almost every Western food known at the time. Over 330 varieties of vegetables and herbs and about 170 fruits. He asked Hemings to take over his kitchens there, but this time um, James wouldn't go so easily. His fame and success had given him the needed leverage to stand up to Jefferson, his oppressor, and advocate for his freedom. Though Jefferson didn't want to lose him, he agreed with one stipulation, one really onerous stipulation, and that is that James trained his successor. He did training not only his brothers Robert and Peter at a cooking school at Monticello, but other slaves in kitchens throughout Virginia. It would take him three years to be able to get them to the level that Jefferson demanded. Hemings was really called upon to experiment with new dishes and cook for diplomats again and other politicians. His food was considered to be half Virginian and half French style. He would make a typical dish would be Virginia ham and chestnut puree. 
artichoke bottoms and truffles served with calvado sauce and beef a la mode with French styled beef bouillon or au jus instead of gravy. He also used a variety of foodstuffs that, Jeff, uh, that Jefferson had imported, such as Italian olive oil and French mustard. Only two of his recipes actually survive, but other family recipes, and there are quite a few books on Jefferson's kitchen, including eight in Jefferson's own hand, include Blanc Mange, which is an almond cream, Nui uh, Macaroni, which is a pa pasta dough, French fries, ice cream, champagne, and macaroni and cheese. Those are also credited to Jefferson, but came out of the kitchens of James Hemings. This is a list on the left of one of the few things that is actually in James Henning's uh, hands, and that is an inventory of all of the kitchen utensils that he had in his possession. This is what's called a manumission agreement drawn up by Jefferson. And um, having been at great expense, and I can't see the, the whole thing, I hope you guys can read it. Uh, anyway, this is a manumission agreement that was signed in which he explains what the agreement is before he could be freed. He was 31 when he uh, actually became a free man, but freedom was very different for black men in America than it had been in Paris. He found himself really a man adrift, searching for his place in the world. He traveled a lot, so much so that Jefferson worried that Hemings' journeys would end in the moon. There's some speculation that he actually went back to Paris, but found that most of his friends had been um, guillotined and um, were no support for him. Eventually, he ended up landing in Baltimore. He was cooking for a tavern keeper there, and he was also drinking heavily. Meanwhile, Jefferson had become president, and he had the impression that Hemings would be willing to come back and work for him again as a free man, most likely because of his relationship with Sally. He thought he'd want to be near his sister. Once he began setting up his presidential household in Washington, he sent an inquiry requesting that Jim, uh, Hemings join him as his personal chef. He heard back through an intermediary that Hemings did not feel he could leave immediately. He returned and not to Washington, but to Monticello in the summer of 1801 and stayed for about six weeks receiving $30 for his work in the kitchen. Just two months later, a Jefferson now in Washington heard a disturbing rumor um, that James Hemings uh, committed suicide. And the only excuse that anybody could sell was that he was driven to drink. This leaves kind of, I think, many questions of him really unanswered because historians really surmise that Hemings must have had ideals and aspirations that he just couldn't make, uh, even as a free man in America. Um, he couldn't realize it in that time and place. And those factors probably really contributed to the depression and ultimately to his death. This is, if you guys remember the movie of um, the Hemings, this is Seth Gilliam as James Hemming and Tandy Newton as Sally, Sally Hemings. There again, much about him has been written. One of the things I want to really clearly state is that nevertheless, he really left an important legacy in culinary history. He, along with the highly trained enslaved individuals who succeeded him in Washington and at Monticello, serve as an inspiration to modern day chefs and culinary historians alike. I will be sending this recipe. This is a recipe for the snow eggs, one of the two remaining recipes that we know for him. You don't need to look at it here because I'll be sending it to you. We saw pictures of her earlier. This is Zephyr Wright. Zephyr Wright was a special guest as President uh, Lyndon Johnson, went through the many pens he used to sign the groundbreaking civil rights bill in 1964. He handed her one saying, you deserve this more than anyone else. Many credit her perspective as influential on President Johnson's commitment to ensuring that a public accommodation section preventing segregation was included in the legislation. She was not a lawmaker. She was not a civil rights activist, really, even though she's later referred to as one, not on the surface, at least. Um, she was just the Johnson family cook. 
a job that she ended up acquiring in 1942 when First Lady Lady Bird Johnson went to Wiley College President Matthew Dogan asking him to find a student she could hire to fill the position. She never held another job, retiring in 1969 when the Johnsons returned to their ranch on the Pertinales River. This is her with Lady Bird Johnson. In the 1930s and 40s, as uh, uh, introduction, Wiley College was really highly recognized for its, uh, for its academic quality. It was the first historic black college in Texas to be accredited. Dr. Dogan, in his last year as a college president, wanted the best student available to work for the family of US Congressman Johnson. So he chose Mrs. Wright, even though she was still an undergraduate. She was born near Marshall, Texas in 1915. She spent the first 11 years of her life on a farm being raised by her maternal grandparents. And as was common at the time, planned to be a domestic servant or to cook for some private family in her hometown, one of the few options open to black women in Texas. Although they didn't know each other personally, Wright and Johnson had much in common. Both were born in rural Texas in towns not far from Marshall, both graduated from the same high school, Marshall High School, and Wright's aunt had worked for Lady Bird Johnson's father. Wright ended up joining the Johnsons in DC soon after LGB won his first congressional race in 1942. And I'm gonna go ahead, good, I put in that slide. Air travel wasn't nearly as preeminent as it is today. So upon accepting the position, Zephyr packed up her bags and jumped in the back of Mrs. Johnson's car, along with two other new hires for the household. That's where things really got interesting. One time I know we stopped at a place and Mrs. Johnson asked them about a place to stay. The woman said, yes, we have a place for you, Mrs. Johnson. I have, um, Mrs. Johnson said, I have these two other people. The woman said, no, we work them, but we don't sleep them. And Mrs. Johnson said, that's a nasty way to be. And she drove away. That didn't mean that Zephyr's right life or those of the other black workers within the Johnson's household became uh, any easier. When LBJ was lobbying for the 1964 Civil Rights Act, he would use the Jim Crow experiences of Zephyr Wright and her husband, Sammy. He would tell the story that he would drive from Texas to Washington, DC. And while they were driving through the South, the Wrights and Johnsons would not be able to eat in the same place. They could not spend the night in the same place, drink water from the same fountain or use the same restroom, even at a gas station. Again, in her words, when we drive to Texas and I have to go to the restroom like Lady Bird or the girls, I'm not allowed to go to the bathroom. I have to find a bush and squat. When it comes time to eat, we can't go into restaurants. We have to eat out of a brown bag. And at night, Sammy sleeps in the front of the car with the steering wheel around his neck and I sleep in the back. We're not going to do that again. So there are uh, historians credit much of Johnson's change in heart about civil rights form because of those experiences with the rights. And I just wanted to give you a few of the types of signs that she would have seen as they were traveling. Zephyr Wright's tenure really marked the zenith of American, uh, African-American influence in the White House kitchen. When Jacqueline Kennedy created the position of White House executive chef, before that, they were just called cooks or chief cook or head cook uh, and hired the Frenchman, Rene Verdun, to fill that position. She really revived the standard from the era of Thomas Jefferson that the White House kitchen should be run by classically trained, read European chefs preparing European food. The food really uh, changed quickly with the arrival of the Southwesterners. This is Zephyr at the kitchen. She cooked for the family and guests. Soon everyone was clamoring for private invitations and a home cooked meal of right Southern cooking, particularly her brownies, fried chicken, hash, popovers, peach ice cream, roasts, spoon bread, and Pedernales River chili. There was soon a battle between uh, Kennedy chef Rene Verdun and LGB, uh, LBJ himself. 
Jeff, uh, Johnson was known to be really frugal. So among the first thing he's did was to shift from fresh vegetables to the cheaper frozen ones. And that really infuriated Verdun. He resigned, scandalized, said he didn't want to lose his reputation by cooking lousy frozen foods in the White House. Within two years, he was out. There was another chef in between and Mrs. Wright became the official White House chef on the tradition of black cooks and chefs in executive positions continued. She really had the Herculean task of managing LBA, uh, LBJ in the White House kitchens. President Johnson was notorious for coming back to the White House late at night uh, to eat his meals, bringing more guests over for meals than were expected and demanding perfection. The scheduling unpredictability and the unpredictability of his temper put a tremendous strain on Wright and the rest of the kitchen staff However, decades of familiarity equipped her with the ability to roll with the pudges. She dealt with unexpected invitees by coordinating with the butlers to liquor up the guests, to keep them distracted and happy while sta staggering how the courses were served so that she could prepare additional items on the fly. Eventually, the pressures took their toll, um, right echoing the sentiments of previous um, inhabitants uh, called the White House a prison. She gained 80 pounds in the five years she worked there and was very unhappy. This is a picture of her with uh, Linda Bird Johnson. Linda Bird wanted to learn how to cook when she was getting married and so she taught her as well. When they end up leaving office, she ended up retiring, remaining in Washington, DC. She had much to say about Johnson afterwards, a man she admired, but understood. Johnson is a controversial figure and he wasn't always on the right side when it came to equality and civil liberties, but I could be candid and honest with him the way only a friend or family member can, which I believe forced him to reconsider some of the racist attitudes he grew up with. I'm um, one of the things, this is a, a, a photo of obviously Jackie Kennedy's uh, cooks. Uh, what uh, I wanted to say is, what can you really learn about the relationship that Johnson and Zephyr uh, Wright had? And one of the things I wanted to acknowledge was that right now, much of our country is again demanding change. That's a really good thing, but it's important to keep in mind that the incessant reputation of an idea doesn't change minds or hearts on its own. Real change tends to come from something more, far more important, personal relationships. You have to remember that the act passed in 64 and she worked with him since 1942. It's really easy to deny the experience of the other until the other becomes your sister, your spouse, your next door neighbor or friend. It's easy to say a problem doesn't exist until the person it's affected is found crying at your kitchen table. Turning a blind eye to a troublesome situation is simple if the situation isn't your own. And now I just wanna go through some of the photos before taking some, um, some questions. These are some of the butlers that uh, worked as well. The butlers are just as much an important part of the food service as anyone else. Here are butlers pictured in front of a dinner setting in the 1980s. Third from left is butler Maitre D. Uh, Alonzo Fields. And if I'm not wrong, he just passed away from COVID. This is, if you guys can tell, is Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower, and he's got his cook. He liked to cook himself. And um, uh, that is John Money. John Money actually served with him from D-Day on, serving all the food for him and came to the uh, White House with him as well. We heard earlier about Dolly. Uh, sometimes people would work in the kitchens and would go on to open their own dining rooms. And uh, I'm gonna talk more about Dolly later in another talk that we're doing called The Culinary Misadventures of Eleanor Roosevelt because her story and so many other stories come forward as well. Again, these are more chefs. This was um, kitchens at different time. This would have been the family kitchen and not the kitchen that would have been used for diplomatic service. And you can see that it continuously gets upgraded. 
This was Obama's, one of Obama's sh uh, chefs. He is known for his biceps. Um, very, very strong. Uh, these are some recipes. I do want to talk just about a couple before we get to the recipes. And that is just that little bit about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, they also had a, a cook that the Roosevelt's thought uh, could play Mammy in the film Gone with the Wind. Eleanor really lobbied the studio uh, on behalf of Lizzie, but she didn't get the role. The other is that in the 1920s, Roosevelt spent some time with Don, uh, with Bonner. I'm going to go, if I can go back, I will get some pictures of her. That is a picture of her. And one of the stories that I like best is that she introduced him to Southern cooking. She, he really liked her pig's feet. Uh, he just would get them as often as he could. She ended up following him to the White House. And one day he invited Winston Churchill. This is during the war and himself. He wanted to be able to serve Winston Churchill some pig's feet. So he uh, had some made. Winston Churchill ate it, thought, this is good, but kind of slimy. And the president laughed and said, yes, they are a bit, but I'm fine to them. Sometimes we'll have to have them fried. Whereupon the prime minister replied, no, thank you. I do not believe I would care for them fried. Uh, they had a hearty laugh. Later, he admitted that all of the food at the White House was pretty horrible. And now you will see some recipes before we open it up. I will be providing you with the Prudinelli's River uh, chili, Daisy Bonner's cheese souffle. This cheese souffle is actually uh, credited to her, but she was inspired by the foods of James Hemings to create it. President Eisenhower also liked an old fashioned beef stew. It was supposed to be a beef stew with vegetables, but it had a lot more beef in it. Minted pea soup was George Washington's among one of his favorite foods. And this is Zephyrus Wright's popovers. So these are also recipes you're gonna get. Uh, I wanna give special thanks to Kelsey Marr, who was our tech host, Christy Brazil, who was the moderator, uh, the curators at Monticello, Mount Vernon, and the Smithsonian, Adrian Miller, who wrote The President's Kitchen Cabinet. His book and speaking appearances inspired this talk. It was a book that um, uh, Kimberly and I both read together, and we thought we would do this program. Jessica Harris is among my favorites. She is an educator and culinary historian, author of 12 cookbooks, which really document the food and food ways of the African diaspora, including High on the Hog, which I really suggest. And Michael Twitty is the author of The Cooking Gene and a living history historian at Williamsburg. He is trying to single-handedly really capture the real food that enslaved people ate in the South uh, in stories. I should also thank the Southern Food Alliance and the Pot Liquor Papers. And you can jump in, uh, Kelsey, because I, I forget who actually is the author of the pot liquor uh, papers and other countless articles in the New York Times, New Yorker, Guardian and other newspapers and um, Wikipedia. Admit it, sometimes the references they provide lead us to the right place. And oftentimes it was the only source of information that I had. And now I want to stop my share and open it up to questions. Well, I'll tell you, Mary Ellen, that was fabulous. You, I think you must've had us all riveted because we don't have a single question, just a lot of kudos from folks who really enjoyed, as I did, um, all this fabulous information that never even had a clue was going on. So thank you so much. And, and feel uh, free to raise your hand if you have a question. As you saw from the list, we're over 150. Christy and I are part of something called the Altered Egos. I know we do a whole lot of railroad stuff, but the story of the president's railroad chefs, I think is worth doing a talk just on that alone <laughs> for all of our railroad buffs. So um, anyone with any, any questions? Also, I'd like to invite everyone to uh, uh, start your video so we can see your fabulous faces here. And we have a, a gallery of people we get to look at instead of just names. And if you'd like to speak, please take your microphone off of mute and join us. Hello. Can you hear me? Be, I knew it would be Tom first. Yes, Tom. Yeah. Okay. I Did you know that we had 
a Sacramento and Delton that was the uh, personal chef for Ronald Reagan. In the Delta? So who was that? Yes, he grew up in the Delta. His sisters went to Cortland High School and his name was Wesley Cato. He owned a restaurant on Freeport Boulevard. And here is a picture that he sent me, great big picture of November 26, 1983, Wesley Cato, Sabero Waker Ram with Ronald Reagan. And uh, he came into my store years ago. He's now passed on. He lived in Sunnyville. And, uh, but he was also involved with the state fair too. Uh, originally chefs cooking at the state fair way back when. So he was close to a hundred years old when I, he came into the, into the store. But anyway, I thought I'd let, let that. Oh, good. That Thank you for sharing that. We must have more questions. Does anyone else have any questions, comments, or maybe your own anecdotes? Well, we have one. It said, did the White House cooks have families and where did they live? Oh, well, there we go. And that, you know, I really suffered through, there was 150 stories that I could have told. Um, and some of them were ones that were better documented, but the stories of the separation from family is the saddest uh, part of all of that. And that is that of course, slaves would be separated from their families and their, um, their children for long periods of, of uh, time. Children could be sold out from um, under them while they were working or shifted from place to, uh, to place. Sometimes they would hire, when there were two people that worked in the kitchen, they would hire a husband and a wife or a brother and a sister or a child, but that was very rare. They did live, the people that lived in the White House, even though I said it was really horrible conditions and it would uh, rain, were much better conditions. There were still slave quarters in Washington, DC for the bulk of the people who worked. So you have to remember all the workers who built the, uh, the White House and it was built by the hands of slaves were enslaved people uh, in horrible conditions. And if they ended up dying on the job, there was no safety, you know, no safety concerns. You would just replace them with another. Mary Ellen, I have a question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that they served ice cream in the uh, Jefferson times. How in the world did they make ice cream during that time? That he, he, you know, they created the first, you know, it was, a, you know, the ice cream with, you know, rock salt and all the others. So they actually did have a machine uh, that, that that was something that he created here in America, but was actually brought the French custard was brought from France. So you have to remember that we, uh, uh, well, I'm going to ask, can anybody guess when we got the first refrigerated grocery store in Sacramento so that you could get ice cream from a grocery store? Anyone want to guess? It was 1888. Holy smokes. 1888. So um, where we got our ice was literally, we would bring them on, you know, barges down big chunks of, of ice. When I was a kid growing up, we still had an ice box. Uh, so you were able to get um, uh, ice. They would actually ship some of it from the east. And by using, you know, heavy salts, you could keep it uh, fairly long. Good. And anyone else? with the question. Concern, something we could have covered that we didn't. No, then we'll, Sigrid, is it your hand up? I, I'm going to uh, assume then that those are all of the questions. <clears throat> I'm going to pause the recording if that is okay and then stick around if anybody just wants to talk. So thank you all for um, coming. I will announce that we have other speakers this week. On Wednesday, we have um, um, Carrie Tilly at seven o'clock who's gonna be talking about the art of food. And if you're a big history fan, you're gonna wanna come to it. I've seen her slideshow. It really does look at the history of food and how it's been documented on everything from uh, cave art to uh, other art. She's gonna do it in two different parts. She's gonna do it up until uh, the modern movement. On Thursday, we have Dunbar Beck with Bruce Marwick. Dunbar uh, Beck was a fantastic artist from Sacramento that was befriended from Eleanor McClatchy, worked in theater the, and others. And then on Friday, Paula Fujiwara is going to finally do her talk that we missed on the Japanese concentration camps 
uh, and the food, it's part of the day of remembrance, the food that was served there and power and resistance as well. 